Well, thank you, Andrea. Uh, appreciate uh, that very kind introduction. And thanks to all our friends at the Capital Factory who for years have been helping DIU uh, bring uh, innovative companies to the military and get those solutions adopted. I'm very excited today to introduce to you my new boss, uh, Ms. Heidi Hsu, the Chief Technology Officer of the Defense Department. And she's really perfect for this role. She's had experience in government at a very senior level, the Assistant Secretary of the Army uh, for Logistics and Technology, or ASALT, uh, if you like the acronym, and also uh, some experience from the private sector where she's been the VP of Technology Strategy for Raytheon's Airborne Systems. In her confirmation hearing at the Senate Armed Services Committee just a few months ago, she emphasized the role of non-traditional innovative companies to serve national security challenges, which is really what Fed Supernova is all about. And I can tell you uh, firsthand, she's bringing uh, a new level of energy to the Pentagon, both in sponsoring adoption of commercial technology, as well as in a key role that we'll, we'll spend some time digging into. She's leading for the Deputy Secretary of Defense the Innovation Steering Group, whose mission is to scale innovation across DOD. Never before has innovation and commercial technology had this level of spotlight across the department. So welcome, Heidi. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you, Michael. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your role as Chief Technology Officer for the Defense Department. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you spend your time and how you're thinking about priorities in that role. Sure. Um before I jump into that, if I may just kind of describe the organization, research and engineering, what we do. We have multiple different organizations. Let me just uh, shed a little bit of light about what we do, okay? Then I can dig into the details. Perfect. Uh, first of all, my goal is to harness this nation's incredible amount of innovation, right? To stay ahead of our adversaries and enable seamless integration of critical technology to be a force multiplier for our US military. That's my goal, okay? And within the research and engineering organization, you've heard about DARPA, which is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And their role, they've been around here for more than 50 years, okay? DARPA's role is to create advanced technologies that provide revolutionary advantage to the warfighter, okay? Uh, DIU, of course, Michael Brown is the lead, the director of Defense Innovation Unit, was created under Dr. Ash Carter to bring dual-use commercial technologies to the military for an obvious reason. The commercial industry is far spending, far outspending the US military in terms of research and uh, development money. So we ought to be leveraging them and bring their innovations in, okay. SDA, you heard a little bit earlier, that's a space development agency that was stood up in 2019 and again, their mission is to accelerate the development and fielding of the next generation of space capabilities by leveraging commercial satellites. So again, you see the commercial link, okay? Uh, missile Defense Agency you heard about. Missile Defense Agency's role and mission is to defend the U.S. homeland by developing a layered missile defense system to protect the US, okay? And then within my organization, there's three other organizations I'll just briefly touch upon. There's a research and technology organization and their role is focusing on emerging technologies. They work very closely with universities, uh, uh, federally funded research and development centers or often it's called FFRDCs as well as uh, UR, uni University Affiliated Research Centers, okay? And they also work with commercial and defense uh, uh, companies as well. Uh, plus, they also have s and linkages into our allies and partners, okay? Um, there's a modernization organization and their focus is really on the critical technology area. They're the single billy button on critical technology areas, okay? And then there's the advanced concepts organization. 
their job is really to prototype and experiment, okay, and deliver solution, innovative solution to enable the joint war fighting capability. Okay, so that kind of encompasses a big picture perspective of what the research and engineering organization does. Okay, so going back to what you started out earlier <laughs> talking about, uh, I talked about my goal. So the path forward that I see that's absolutely critical is, first of all, I'm a full believer in teamwork. Okay, we've got to collaborate across our technology ecosystem. Okay. Namely, I want to see stronger partnership and collaboration uh, across the entire ecosystem so we can collectively solve the toughest technical challenges, right? And bring a solution space much quicker to our warfighter. Okay. Um, I want to leverage commercial companies, R&D. I've already talked about that. So I can accelerate the incorporation of the latest commercial technologies into the DOD. So we can shrink uh, the development to production timeline and get the fielding to the hands of the warfighter much quicker, okay? Um, I also believe that we're in the process of creating a campaign of rapid joint experimentation. And this is an initiative uh, that was started by DepSecDef, okay, Kath Hicks. Uh, she stood up the innovation steering group with a goal of pushing innovation much, much quicker. So uh, there is a funding that's called, uh, that, that was set aside to do rapid joint experimentation. So what we have done here is working with our joint staff to understand what are the capability gaps at the joint fight Okay. And then from the capability gaps that's articulated, we went to the services and asked, okay, where are the solution space, right? Do you guys have ideas? Do you guys have products you want to deliver so we can conduct this joint experimentation? Okay. And then the results of the joint experimentation can inform us, does this particular product close a specific capability gap? And if so, how do we rapidly transition it? Okay. Um, and if the capability, uh, if the product uh, desires another iteration, and then we go back into the feedback loop. So the desire is to have multiple sprints, okay, per year. The first sprint was then internally because uh, I think it was time limited, okay. And we are learning from that. The next sprint we're setting up uh, next year is we want to expand the capability in terms of having uh, federally funded research and development centers, as well as companies to propose their products, namely bring your product. If you think your product can close the capability gap that we articulated, we'd like to be able to experiment with it. So this is, these are all the things that we're doing under the Innovation Steering Group umbrella, okay? And the other thing I think uh, Michael and I talked about is uh, there's a lot of innovation centers across the DOD, right? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm trying to get my arms around the multitude of innovation centers, all doing rapid uh, development and, and hopefully a rapid experimentation. So we literally are uh, doing investigation, who has what, right? I'm trying to understand uh, each of the, these different innovation groups. What is their role? What is their mission? What are they focused on? And what are they buying? Who are they buying stuff from, right? And what is the capability of the product that they're buying? And how successful have we been in terms of transitioning? And what are the lessons learned that we can improve our processes, right? So, sorry it took so long, Michael. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot to cover. First of all, big organization and uh, a lot is changing, which, which is pretty exciting. And you, you talked about a number of things that I think uh, everyone listening uh, is excited about. The leverage of commercial technologies, the acceleration of the timeline, more joint experimentation. So I think we're excited to see uh, some of this come to fruition. Maybe some advice for some of the companies who are listening. 
uh, one of the things that uh, even though we have a number of innovation organizations, we still have not been able to make it easy for companies to, I heard you say, find the front door of the Pentagon and then uh, find a way to work with uh, with DOD. So as we try and lower the barriers to working with DOD, maybe you could share a little bit about your advice for companies about how they should think to plug into these efforts. What would you like to see us do, maybe even DIU do, to lower those barriers to make it easier for companies to find the front door and get access to uh, Pentagon contracts? Yeah, so Michael, this is something I heard repeatedly when I was uh, uh, on the outside, uh, especially helping out some of the smaller companies. That it's it, within the DOD, it's like, it, it isn't one person that you call, right? It's multiple phone calls, who knows who, who knows who. So you're doing this hopscotch across the pond to figure out who's the right person to talk to, okay? Um, I think DIU has done a marvelous job of working with basically the users to identify what problems that they have, right? And from the problem space, you're going out to uh, commercial companies. Uh, who has a product that can solve this problem? And uh, the fact that you can provide the ceiling funding to them, it really helps the innovative smaller companies to really nurture their ideas and build the product and showcase it. So DIU is a great entry into this. I will tell you, um, because there's a multitude of different organizations also doing uh, different things, uh, I just came down, I uh, came back from uh, Huntsville uh, last week, visiting uh, Army's uh, Rapid Capability and Critical Technology Office. So they are also what, what they're focused on is they go to two of the Army program executive offices and trying to understand what, what is your capability gap? And what solutions are you looking for? Then they go out and ask for white papers to industry. Here are the capability gaps we're looking for. And they get hundreds of white papers coming in, okay? So they evaluate the white papers and from the best ideas, they basically, uh, I think the last tranche, uh, which is the third iteration, they selected like a top four, 40 white papers and invited industry to come and brief. 30 minutes, brief your ideas. But what they did, which I thought was smart, is they the top 40 they selected, they actually gave them $5,000. This is your travel money, right? <laughs> it helps out the little business, incentivize them to actually work uh, uh, with the DOD. Okay. Then the top 40 are coming in. And, and by the way, people sitting on the source selection, namely who, who has the best idea, are the users, the program executive office folks who are, who are looking for these ideas. They're saying, hey, this is really great. I want this company to be funded. So they've plugged in the user group the, uh, and the acquisition folks with the um, uh, Rapid Capability and Critical Technology Office. So they have three different entities tied together. And so once they do the final down select there, those are people they rapidly give contracts to. Okay, so, so that's working quite well. Uh, but uh, I mean, the process trying to understand what are the other organizations doing? At the same time, I want to let you know, Jen Bird, who's on my innovation steering group, I've asked her to go, reach out to the Small Business Technology Council because they actually have tens and thousands of small companies that they represent. So I said, and I had a one hour phone call with them and that was prior to confirmation. And to understand, you know, what, what are the impediments that small companies have and what are the things we can do differently, okay? Uh, one other thing just to let you know, we're going to be requesting legislation on the Hill to give us the ability to fund uh, multiple tranches of uh, the, the small business innovation research uh, funding. There's Cibers 1, which is usually 500K, Cibers 2 up to 1.5 million. Uh, usually what happens after that, unless a program office picks up, you fall into the valley of death. Uh, we're proposing to have multiple phase two tranches money to continue to mature the technology, to basically 
pave over the valley of death, right? <laughs> okay. So we're definitely all years in uh, wanting to hear about some additional challenges and help us to to come out with ideas to help out the small businesses. I'm sure that's uh, welcome to everyone listening. Uh, two ways I think uh, that we're looking to pave over that Valley of Death. Uh, the DAU has started the National Security Innovation Capital Initiative right. this year, deploying the first funds that Congress allocated so we can get more, uh, we can catalyze more private investment in dual use hardware technologies because our venture capital and uh, private capital uh, through uh, uh, whether it's uh, venture, private equity, et cetera, adequately funds our software industry, but the military needs hardware and that's been hard capital to come by except from adversaries. So we're looking to be able to find friendly sources of future hardware technologies and get those vendors going, areas like batteries, quantum sensors, things like that. Yeah. And also exciting this year in the NDAA uh, is the Warfighter Innovation Scaling Fund. So prototypes that are successful that we might work on. Now there's a fund, if the appropriations uh, follows, to be able to take successful prototypes and make sure there's money to scale those ahead of uh, uh, the being programmed in the, the Pentagon budget cycle of what we call PPB&E. So I think so, a lot of efforts underway to pave that uh, valley of death that we're looking forward, uh, forward to doing. Let's let's shift a little bit to the future. So uh, uh, some of the priorities that you have for the future technology areas that companies might want to be thinking about as they plan their investments so that uh, where they're investing can help us in the national security space. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for asking. Uh, I think the first thing that I, I'm very much interested in, is there's been you know, billions of dollars that's been spent on AI and ML, as well as in the autonomy area. What I'm interested in is the development of a trusted AI ML, trusted autonomy. Because the first time this uh, uh, this unmanned platform does something that the user didn't anticipate, you're going to lose trust in this unmanned system, right? So I want to have uh, the ability to have trusted AI ML, trusted autonomy. Uh, the other uh, priority area I think is very important for me is, you know, we typically have signal intelligence, radar systems, electronic warfare systems, cybers. They're all in different stovepipes, okay? But to, we need now to operate at the intersection of those capabilities to address the advanced threats. You don't have the time or the leisure to say, I detect a bad guy, then I'm gonna track it, and then I'm gonna do something against it in terms of electronic warfare. You gotta do it much, much quicker, right? So our system has to be designed so, it so that it can operate in the intersection of those capabilities, okay? Um, clearly, resilient networks is critical. Uh, because if your network goes down, you're not able to connect. And that's, uh, that's a bad day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so resilient network, command, control, and communication uh, to enable us to have the seamless connectivity is critical, okay? Um, I will also talk about the other thing that I'm very interested in is AR, VR, and live training is uh, this technology is really maturing by the game, gaming industry, right? I want to be able to leverage the technology, technology, commercial technology that's out there and figure out how we can leverage that to, to enable us to have distributed operations so we can enable rapid mission planning and command and control, right? In a low bandwidth environment. Because guess what? In a contesting environment, you don't have all the bandwidth that you would like to have. You may not have 5G, right? So how do you enable that op operation? Okay, so that's going to be really important. Um, of course, uh, in the area of direct energy, I'm interested in high energy lasers. Okay, uh, I'm also in interested in high power microwave. 
uh, hypersonics. It's a little bit harder to look for commercial hypersonics, <laughs> but you never know right? in terms of uh, what's art of possible out there. Um, there's assured, uh, there's you know, on the software and processing side, I am very interested in having assured software. Okay. Uh, again, uh, you want to be able to trust the software that you're developing. And that's one of the very difficult issues that we're dealing with. Right. Um, do, you want to, do you want to define that a little bit? Uh, you, you're talking about ensuring the uh, validity of the code that it's not been tampered with? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Um, and then in the area of emerging technology, I want to touch a little bit upon that as well. Um, there is absolutely a race in the quantum computer world, right? And you can see that there's all kinds of innovative small companies that's been funded by venture venture company. I think the last count, there's over a hundred different companies just within the US that's all focusing on quantum computers, right? So um, for in my interest, I'm interested in, in, in obviously in quantum computers because you potentially could have the ability to break encryptions, right? So I wanna make sure that we can develop and design and develop quantum computer that's scalable, okay? Um, in the area of biotechnology, I'm very interested in uh, avoid um, having the ability to do sensing, avoiding surprises, and utilize biotech to help us in resolving logistics problems, okay? Um, and then, uh, Advanced materials is a huge area in terms of uh, there, we're interested in advanced material that's, uh, that's stronger and lighter weight, right? Uh, materials that can uh, operate at higher temperature, right? Uh, materials that give us higher reliability, right? All of that, uh, materials that gives us uh, higher efficiency, right? Uh, all of that reduces cost, reduces maintenance. So, all of those things I'm interested in, <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe a good time to mention our newest portfolio at DIU is advanced energy materials. So looking at the advanced materials, plus also how can we be greener, um, yes. which is not just about climate change, but how to have a more resilient force. It's not tied to a, a supply chain. And then another uh, priority I know uh, that uh, we have is cyber. So that affects almost every technology that we deploy these days. And we've got to make sure that they're secure. You bet. So, uh, a lot, a lot to focus on, and uh, we're uh, all supporting and cheering on your success. Well, appreciate your uh, taking the time. We'll just see if you have uh, anything you want to close with here, Heidi. Well, I, I want to thank you for the this opportunity to kind of share some of my thoughts with you. Unfortunately, I'm not there in person. I would much rather to be there in person with you. But uh, hopefully, when we get over this hump, COVID hump. I'll be able to uh, meet with you uh, in person and chat a little bit more about what we're doing within the DOD. So thank you very much. It's been fantastic chatting with you guys. Thanks, Heidi, so much for being with us. Uh, uh, we're very excited about your role as CTO and leading the Innovation Steering Group. Uh, there couldn't be anything we think is more important than scaling innovation across the department. So looking forward to working with you. And Maybe just uh, for all our listeners, we really need your capability. I know Heidi's very committed to this. We can't do what we need to at the Defense Department alone, just with federal dollars anymore. We need all of the innovative capability that you're bringing and solutions you're developing for the commercial market. So we're looking forward to working with you a lot more closely going forward than maybe we even have in the past. So thank you so much to Capital Factory, to you, Heidi, uh, for being with us at this event today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.